Hi, my name is Tim Brill, coming to you from Reno, Nevada. I want to talk right now about stall spin awareness in small general aviation airplanes. Uh, pilots still seem to have a particular problem when they fly their airplanes low and slow and while they're turning. And although the numbers of stall spin accidents has in fact Oh, statistically decreased over the years. Still, if it's a small general aviation fatal accident, chances are it's a stall spin accident. So that's what we want to talk about today. But before we continue, let's talk a little bit about some definitions. We have our classic airplane wing here. Um, notice we have the top section, the bottom section, the leading edge of the wing, and the trailing edge of the wing. And of course, if we were to draw a line equidistant between the top and the bottom from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the wing, that's called our cord line. Meanwhile, as the airfoil, the wing, is moving forward, it's generating a relative wind in the opposite direction of the motion of the wing and at the same velocity as the motion of the wing. And of course, the angle formed between the cord line of the wing and the relative wind is the angle of attack. So let's look at what happens to the aircraft uh, as the angle of attack increases. And I've drawn it out here on this graph. What we have over here is the what we'll call the coefficient of lift and drag. And what we have at the bottom is the angle of attack increasing in this direction. And what you notice is every aircraft will have a graph that looks like this, but specifically, as the angle of attack increases, this blue line here increases up to a maximum point, then starts to decrease. The blue line, of course, is the lift generated by the wing. The red line keeps increasing. This is the drag component. So, what we notice is as the angle of attack increases, Lift is going to increase to a certain amount, maximum amount, and then start to decrease. Drag, on the other hand, is going to continuously increase. Now this point here of maximum lift is given a special name. It's called the critical angle of attack. And what we know is the critical angle of attack separates this graph into two sections over here where lift increases faster than drag is what we call normal flight. Over here where drag increases faster than lift is called stalled flight. So the critical angle of attack is the transition from our normal flight region to our stalled flight region. Notice nothing in this graph talks about weight or speed or any of those other issues. It's purely a function of the angle of attack. In other words, the aircraft can increase its angle of attack to a maximum point. That maximum point, the critical angle of attack, is where the aircraft is going to be generating its most lift. As you transition past the critical angle of attack into what you would call stalled flight, now all of a sudden the airplane starts to generate drag faster than lift as opposed to normal flight where it's generating lift faster than drag. Now the drag component that we're speaking of is essentially two part. Down here at the lower angle of attack end of things that's pretty much what we would call parasitic drag. You know all the uh, stuff hanging off the aircraft from antennas to the struts to the wheels everything else. As we get up here into this stall flight region, it's pretty much what we would call induced drag. Also, back to our other graft, what we know is as you exceed the critical angle of attack, the air flowing over the upper portion of the wing can no longer smoothly follow the contour of the wing. So what happens? You start to get a burble, an airflow separation, starting from the trailing edge of the wing and working its way forward to the leading edge of the wing. This airflow separation is oftentimes also called the stall and of course will happen when we exceed the critical angle of attack. This airflow separation is also 
known as induced drag. It's a byproduct of lift, and that's why when we exceed the critical angle of attack, that drag component goes up very quickly. So again, normal flight is characterized by the aircraft generating lift faster than drag. Stall flight is characterized by the airplane generating drag faster than lift. This transition happens at the critical angle of attack. Now that being said, wouldn't it be nice to know when you're getting close to that critical angle of attack so you could get yourself ready for this transition from normal flight to stalled flight. Uh, in your private pilot flight training, you were expected to do just that. It was called announcing the imminent stall. The FA in their infinite wisdom doesn't call getting close to the critical angle of attack what I just said. Gee, we're getting close and as a result, the behavior of the airplane may change. No, they call it the imminent stall. They make it sound very ominous. Uh, what do you know about the imminent stall? About when you're getting close? Well, you were taught as a private pilot to put on your detective's cap and look for different clues. Firstly, you were taught a, uh, to evaluate a number of what I would call mechanical clues. Stall warning horn, stall warning light, angle of attack indicator. Uh, there's all sorts of different mechanical clues that are incorporated into the cockpit of the airplane to tell you as the pilot in command that you are in fact getting close to the critical angle of attack and could go from normal flight to stalled flight. Then, of course, you have all the aerodynamic clues. Now, perhaps the best aerodynamic clue is this. If I were to look for my bullseye, and I wanted to get the bullseye right here, this clue is what we call mush. And mush is a technical term, go figure, and it is an aerodynamic clue that you are getting very close to that critical angle of attack. Now, what is mush? We know that when we're flying, say cruise, all you need to do is make a small deflection of one of the control surfaces, the ailerons, the elevator, the rudder, into the airflow that's flowing over the control surface, and the airplane will respond. Well, when you're close to this critical angle of attack, or perhaps something's broken, and you are mushing the airplane, all of a sudden those small inputs tend to become very large inputs, huge control surface inputs to get the airplane to respond with what previously was a small control input. That's called mush, and it's a bullseye clue that you are close to that critical angle of attack. And of course, as the pilot in command, you can then either continue with the inputs, transition into stalled flight, or you can essentially reverse the inputs and transition back into normal flight. You have that choice. Um, other aerodynamic clues besides mush are the aerodynamic buffeting that pilots experience when they're getting close to that critical angle of attack. And interestingly, when you ask pilot what causes the buffeting, most of the pilots say it's the actual airflow separation over the uh, upper part of the wing that causes the vibration. And I don't think that's necessarily true. If you were to look at an airplane, an airfoil, we have the lumpy air that's spilling off the trailing edge of the wing. And of course the lumpy air is going down towards the ground. Not because that lumpy air is any different air density than the surrounding air, but that's the way the airfoil is shaped. Wings have a definite shape on the upper contour of the wing. It's pointed downhill, so all that's happening is the airflow is just following the shape and spiraling down towards the ground. If the airplane were inverted, it would actually momentarily spiral up towards the blue sky. But, suffice to say, we have this lumpy, turbulent air coming off the wings. At the same time, the airplane is still moving forward. So what part of the airplane now is flying through the lumpy, turbulent air coming off the front of the airplane? Well, the back end, the tail, the elevator, the rudder. This whole back part of the aircraft is now flying through the lumpy, turbulent air coming off the front part of the airplane. And as a result, 
you will feel that aerodynamic buffeting. In fact, in my Super Decathlon, I notice, number one, my uh, control stick starts to shake. That's the elevator, of course, back here in the trailing edge. That's the stick shaker uh, that sometimes is mechanically linked from that control surface into the cockpit. And I also notice that my rudder pedals will start to vibrate. Well, the rudder is back here as well, going through that lumpy air. And if you pay particular attention to what's happening in the airplane, you'll actually feel the elevator and the rudder, as I said, begin to vibrate due to those control surfaces flying into the lumpy air caused by the wings. Now, some of you may also recall in your flight training days that uh, somebody perhaps said something to the effect of, if it's a power on stall, you may not notice that aerodynamic buffeting. And you have to ask, but well, why is that? Well, when we have the power on, the propeller slipstream that's circling around the aircraft and over the tail tends to smooth that lumpy air out, so you don't notice it as much. But regardless, aerodynamic clues are, are uh, things that you as the pilot command need to think about in terms of where you are relative to this critical angle of attack. Mush being the most bullseye, the aerodynamic bushing also being very important. There's another thing I find kind of interesting. When are people most likely to mush the airplane? Surprisingly, it's on final approach. <laughs> They're afraid to point the nose towards the ground and then do a nice flare and land. No, what they do is they fly the entire final approach kind of at a relatively high angle of attack, mushing the airplane all the way down until they hit something. And when they do get to the ground, they oftentimes think, boy, what a great landing that was. Well, they've mushed the airplane all the way down. And it's these same people that are afraid of stalling the airplane in the first place that have no problem flying the airplane very close to the stall, close to the ground. I've always found that to be a little, a little odd. Anyways, and we have a third group of clues, and those are all the other, oh, what I would call miscellaneous clues. The stall, the, the airspeed, if you have a attitude indicator looking at the flight attitude, uh, you know, you just get a sense that something's not right. So, as the pilot in command, as you start to increase the angle of attack, you slowly move yourself, perhaps, to this critical angle of attack. And as you get close to the critical angle of attack, again, you put on your detective's cap, you look at the mechanical clues, the aerodynamic clues, the miscellaneous clues that tell you exactly where you are. Because if you exceed the critical angle of attack, and transition into the stalled flight. Now that drag increases faster than lift, the airplane's going to behave differently than if you relax the elevator and you transition back over to a normal flight where the airplane is generating lift faster than drag and as a consequence, behaving differently. So how the airplane behaves here is very different from how the airplane will behave there. Although, as you're gonna find in a minute, both the areas are completely controllable if you actually know how to do it. Now, one last thing, you as the pilot command have control over the angle of attack with the elevator. What you don't have control of is this critical angle of attack. The critical angle of attack is designed by the aircraft's manufacturers. Generally speaking, in a small general aviation aircraft, the critical angle of attack is going to be, oh, 18 to 22 degrees. However, here's the problem. If you're thinking two-dimensionally, you would think, oh, gee, if I move the aircraft 18 to 22 degrees above the horizon, I should at that point have reached or perhaps exceeded the critical angle of attack and now stalled the airplane. What you're forgetting is airplanes are three-dimensional. So it's really the rate at which you're changing the angle of attack. At any attitude, if I change the trajectory or the rate uh, slow enough, the motion of the airplane and the relative wind are always such that even for an aerobatic pilot in a loop, 
I'm never going to actually exceed the critical angle of attack and stall the airplane. So that's an important thing to remember is airplanes are three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. If you want to stall an airplane, yank back really hard. If you want to do a loop, yeah, you need to get the entry speed, pull back relatively hard, but not so hard that you exceed the critical angle of attack. You change the trajectory of the nose, the flight path, slow enough that the angle of attack, the angle between the cord line of the wing and the relative wind, essentially will never exceed 22 degrees in our little scenario, and as a result, never exceed the critical angle of attack. Okay, back again. Let's talk about a scenario. Let's say that we're flying someplace over here in normal flight. Well, let's say there. And as we're flying, our left wing drops. Well, what does everybody do to go back to level flight? Well, most of the time, in this case, you'll add right aileron. When we add right aileron, the aileron on the right wing, say, will point towards the blue sky. That's going to change the angle of attack. Specifically, by moving the aileron to the right and having the aileron point to the blue sky, the angle of attack on the right wing is going to reduce. Conversely, the angle of attack on the left wing it's going to be the aileron will now be pointing towards the ground. That's going to change slightly the cord line of the left wing and actually increase the angle of attack on the left wing. So in other words, left wing drops, we add right aileron, the aileron the right wing now points to the blue sky. That effectively lowers the angle of attack on the right wing. Alternatively, the aileron in the left wing now points to the ground. That effectively increases the angle of attack on the left wing. And we can graph this. So we know when left wing drops, we add right aileron to level the wings. Angle of attack on the left wing increases because of the downward deflected aileron. And alternatively, the angle of attack on the right wing decreases because the aileron is pointed towards the blue sky. And if we look at our graph, what we notice is well, geez, the left wing now generates more lift than the right wing. Which is why when you're flying, left wing drops, you add right aileron, you actually increase the angle of attack, increase the lift on the left wing, and voila, you're back to wings level. Notice also that the left wing also generates a little bit more drag than the right wing. So at the same time that your wings are going back to wings level, the left wing, uh, the nose of the airplane is dragging slightly towards the left side. So again, left wing drops, we add right aileron, Aileron on the right side points to the blue sky. Aileron on the left side points to the ground. The left wing now is at a higher angle of attack, so it generates more lift, but also at the same time drags the nose slightly towards the left. That dragging the nose slightly to the, towards the left, incidentally, is known as adverse yaw. So that's what you normally experience. Let's say, however, that we've now exceeded the critical angle of attack. We're flying over here someplace, and the same thing happens. The left wing drops, and you're a typical pilot, and you say, oh, I know what to do. I'll add right aileron. Now, of course, we're in the stalled flight region, and even though mechanically the ailerons move the same way, in other words, left wing drops, I add right aileron, right aileron points to the blue sky, left aileron points to the ground, mechanically the same direction. The left wing now is, of course, going to be at a higher angle of attack than the right wing, but because we've now exceeded the critical angle of attack and we're in that stalled flight region, what we notice is 
the left wing now doesn't come back to level flight, it actually generates less lift and it drops even more. And of course about this time the average pilot will say, hmm, maybe I didn't add enough right aileron. And they add more right aileron and what they experience is, geez, the left wing drops even more. And at the same time, there's a very noticeable increase in drag to the right to the left side. So not only do we uh, experience a situation where the left wing drops more because there's less lift, but there's also more drag. Less lift, more drag, less lift, more drag. And before you know it, the airplane in this situation has entered into an auto rotation known as a spin. So what do we know? All these myths. Myth number one, you'll hear pilots say, oh, the airplane is uncontrollable when you go into that stalled flight region. Why? Well, because down here, when I added right aileron to level the wings, the airplane did what I wanted it to do. Over here, when I added right aileron to level the wings, the airplane did just the opposite. Of course, the problem is that this is exactly what the airplane's designed to do. <laughs> Aerodynamically, it will do just the opposite of what you think it should be doing, at least in terms of the ailerons. Uh, so pilots think the airplane is broken, it's uncontrollable. The other myth that you hear is that the stall caused the spin, because in this specific scenario, we had stalled the airplane, and the airplane started, uh, in this case, the left wing was generating less lift and more drag, and it transitioned into this auto rotation called the spin. So that's another myth. And ultimately what you're going to discover is, although the airplane has to be stalled before it will spin, it's not the stall that causes the spin. It's the excessive drag or the yaw when the airplane is stalled that causes the spin. Let's talk about something else. What did we exactly do to cause the angle of attack on one wing to be different than the angle of attack on the other wing. Well, it's simple. We put in the ailerons. The more aileron deflection we put in, effectively, the farther apart we're moving the left wing from the right wing in terms of their angle of attack. The more aileron we put in, the more, the greater the difference in the lift and drag generated one side of the airplane versus the other side of the airplane. Uh, and if you were to look at this point at your inclinometer ball, you're going to discover it's not centered. In other words, the inclinometer ball will be centered when both wings are at the same angle of attack, essentially generating the same amount of lift and the same amount of drag. As we separate, as we get one side of the airplane, one wing, to be at a different angle of attack than the other wing, generating a different amount of lift and a different amount of drag than the other wing, then that inclinometer ball that pilots use to ensure what they call coordinated flight is not going to be in the middle anymore. So if by adding the aileron deflection causes this imbalance left and right, what can we do? Well, put the ailerons back to neutral. Regardless of whether we're stalled or unstalled in normal flight, if we neutralize the ailerons, the left wing and the right wing will now be at the same angle of attack, generating the same amount of lift and the same amount of drag. And as a consequence, over here in our stall flight region, when we get the ailerons back to neutral, we've really reduced our likelihood of going into that auto rotation known as a spin. Problem though, as we go back to our initial idea, gee, left wing dropped, we want to raise it, and now we've decided not to use the ailerons, what can we do to raise the wings? Well, it's simple. Left wing drops. What happens if I add right rudder? If I had right rudder, what I'm doing is I'm essentially accelerating that left wing forward. I'm yawing the nose of the airplane to the right. And as the left wing accelerates going forward, it now generates more lift. And as a result of generating more lift, it comes back to wings level. Now you might be able to get by down here, leveling the wings with the ailerons, 
if you exceed the critical angle of attack and you play in that stalled flight region, it's certainly going to not be a good idea to use the ailerons. They're just going to make your life really miserable. <laughs> because again, although mechanically they deflect the same way in stalled flight as they did normal flight, aerodynamically they're going to do just the opposite of what you think. And your best bet then is to just use the rudder pedals to maintain level flight. Now I know what some of you are thinking, well gee, maybe in stall flight, maybe if the left wing drops, instead of using right ailerons, since the aerodynamically the ailerons have the opposite effect, why don't we use left aileron? Tell you, it's not going to work. <laughs> not only is your brain not calibrated very uh, well to all of a sudden reverse control inputs, but it's not going to be at all effective the most effective way to control the airplane in this stall flight region is with the rudders. Keep the ailerons neutral, keep your feet moving, dance on those rudder pedals. That will keep that inclinometer ball centered and at that point the only thing you need do to go from the stall flight region to the normal flight region is to reduce the angle of attack by relaxing the elevator back pressure. Or you can keep the elevator back pressure and stay here in this stall flight region. Sometimes it's an exercise known as a rudder stall or a falling leaf. And in fact, if you get savvy enough, you can turn the airplane 90 degrees left, 90 degrees right. You've got total control of your airplane in this stalled flight region if you communicate with it properly. And properly means ailerons neutral, or dance on the rudder pedals, use your feet. Let's talk about another aspect of stalls. Okay, I have here our lift formula where lift is a function of the coefficient of lift times one half rho v squared times s where the coefficient of lift of course is the angle of attack as well as the wing shape. Rho happens to be the air density, v is the velocity, and s is the wing surface area. So if people ask you, well, gee, what uh, affects the amount of lift in this case that the wing is generating, well, it's the angle of attack, the wing shape, the air density, the speed, and the wing surface area. Let's assume for right now that we can't change the wing surface area and that the air density is for the most part constant. So really all we have that affects lift is the angle of attack and the speed. So let's think about this. Let's say that we have an 1800 pound airplane. How much lift do we need to generate to keep an 1800 pound airplane in the air? Oh, about 1800 pounds. If we generate 1801 pounds, we climb. If we generate 1799 pounds, we descend. Well, what do we have to do to generate that 1800 pounds of lift? we know that we have some maximum angle of attack let's say that might be 20 degrees times some speed squared where you can algebraically figure out the speed don't test me on this one and that speed might end up being your VSO your stall speed in the landing configuration basically what it's saying is if you stall the airplane you're now not going to be generating enough lift to keep you in the air so if you don't want to stall the airplane, of course, the only option you have is to descend. Lower the angle of attack, and you're starting to descend. Uh, just a slightly different way of looking at it. But let's look at a few other things. As a result of this, let's say that we're flying in a 60-degree bank. We still have to have 1,800 pounds of a vertical lift component to maintain level flight. But in a 60-degree bank, we're also going to have 1,800 pounds of a horizontal component. Our resultant component is 3,600 pounds, also sometimes called 2 Gs. So what do we have to do now to generate 3,600 pounds of lift? We can't increase the angle of attack anymore. The only thing we can now do is actually have to fly faster. We have to increase our velocity. 
and that's the basis of what is sometimes known as load factor. It's also the basis of what you were taught as being an accelerated stall. In other words, put the airplane into a bank, all of a sudden now to maintain level flight, you have to go faster because you've broken the lift vectors into a vertical component and a horizontal component. At a 60 degree bank, the vertical and the horizontal are the same. At a 90 degree bank, <laughs> It's essentially infinite. Aerobatic pilots manage to fly at a 90 degree bank. We call it a knife edge because, quite honestly, the rudder now becomes our elevator. And the whole airplane, the aerodynamics and the airflow is change. But that's the basis of that accelerated stall. In other words, again, put the airplane in a bank turn and you have to increase the speed to generate the lift required for level flight. Let's look at two other scenarios. You know your soft field takeoff. What happens in a soft field takeoff? Well, you are taught that you can hold some elevator back pressure, get in the air close to the ground, and it's, you create a, a cushion of air between the ground and the wings. You artificially increase the air density. And as a result of increasing the air density, you can now actually get off the ground into the air at a lower airspeed. But what else do you know about that soft field landing? Your instructor probably said, oh boy, once you're in ground effect and that cushion of air that you've created, make sure you stay there long enough to generate enough velocity so now when you actually climb out of ground effect, you keep climbing. Or if you climb too fast, <laughs> The air density and velocity switch right away and boom, right back down on the ground you go. One other thing of looking at is real classic here at our local Reno State Airport in the summer where it's 90 degrees and the asphalt on the runway might be, oh God, hot enough to boil an egg. As you get on your landing and you get close to the ground, you think, man, I've got a perfect landing set up and at the last minute you just fall out of the sky. Boom! Have a really hard landing. What's happening there? Well, look at the formula. As you get close to the ground, because of it being so hot, all of a sudden the air density <laughs> drops. It's very low. So unless you increase the velocity very quickly, you're just going to fall out of the sky. And that's what oftentimes what a lot of pilots uh, experience uh, at our local airport anyways. So again, Stalls, they're not to be afraid, uh, necessarily afraid of. In fact, although so many pilots are afraid of stalls because they're not sure what the airplane's supposed to do and they're convinced that it's going to lead them into a spin, which it's not, you know, you are also taught at some point about this concept known as maneuvering speed, V sub A. And what's that? Well, at maneuvering speed, you'll stall the airplane before you break it. It's that rough air penetration speed. In other words, that same thing that so many pilots are afraid of, the stall, in this case acts like a pressure relief valve and a pressure cooker. I'd rather stall the airplane than break it. That's the basis of maneuvering speed. Let's take a look now at spins and spin recoveries. Remember, a spin is a rolling and yawing motion of the airplane. So we can essentially say that uh, spin is a coupling of roll plus yaw. Uh, at least that's how my friend Rich Stowell explained it to me years ago. Let's look at some of the steps incorporated into a spin recovery. Uh, we use this acronym PAIR, P-A-R-E, P for power, A, ailerons, R, rudder, E, elevator. One of the first things we're going to discover is... Those are the only controls you have in the airplane. You have the throttle, you have the ailerons, the rudders, the elevator. There's really nothing else. Also, we have this concept known as a spin axis. So, in other words, when the airplane is spinning, it's rotating around this vertical line called the spin axis. The spin axis is a vertical line that goes through the center of gravity of the airplane, and it's just essentially rotating around this spin axis. 
in a typical decathlon or 172, the nose might be, oh, maybe 50, 60 degrees below the horizon. It's certainly not vertical. But that's all that we're doing is just this auto rotation, this rolling, yawing motion of the airplane along its spin axis, which is a vertical line that goes through the center of gravity of the airplane. And that's a very different from something that we'll get into down the road called a spiral, where you're actually flying a very steep turn going downhill. The spin, the airplane is rotating along this point known as the spin axis. So if we were to take a look and let's say that uh, we, we use the idea of a barbell. So this line here represents our airplane. Down here we have the nose of the airplane, up here we have the tail of the airplane, and notice the spin axis goes right through the center of gravity of the airplane. So we're auto-rotating, we're in this thing called a spin. So how do we get out of it? Well, look at the steps. P, power. What happens to your airplane if you add the power? Well, most airplanes, the nose actually pitches towards the blue sky. If you add the power to get out of the spin, the same thing's going to happen. The nose is going to pitch to a higher, um, towards the blue sky. The tail is going to come down lower. And in fact, now we'll be in what they call a flatter spin. Instead of coming down here, all of a sudden the airplane is up here, rotating faster. Since power has no effect on roll or yaw, it really has no effect on your spin recovery and should be the first thing that you identify. The first step is to identify the throttle, the power, and pull it to idle. Get rid of it. Get it off. It's of no use to you whatsoever. The next step are the ailerons. We've already spoken about how the ailerons uh, aerodynamically do just the opposite of what you think they should do when you've exceeded the critical angle of attack. So, get them out of the equation as well. Ailerons go neutral. So the first two steps in any spin recovery is going to be power idle, ailerons neutral. Power off, ailerons neutral. And they don't need to be done simultaneously. Just identify the throttle, not the mixture, not the propeller, not the cabin heat. Pull it to idle neutralize the ailerons. Now, the next step, the rudder. Uh, the airplane is spinning because, yes, it is stalled, but also it has an excessive amount of yaw. So we need to cancel that yaw by pushing the opposite rudder, full opposite rudder. Opposite to what? Well, opposite to the direction of the spin which means if we're spinning to the left, our spin recovery will require the application of full opposite, or in this case, full right rudder. Alternatively, if we're spinning to the right, we push in full left rudder. Now the problem is going to be, how do you know which rudder to push? That inclinometer ball that oftentimes people default to, perhaps is not as useful as you think, because once you're in the spin, that ball is kind of inertially locked one side or the other. It might be the side that you want to step on the ball. It may be the, the wrong side. A, a better indicator than the inclinometer ball might be that uh, turn and bank coordinator, you know, that a little electric gyro that you have. If it's showing the airplane's left wing, quote unquote, down, rolling to the left, then pretty good chance that you're spinning to the left. Perhaps the best way to determine which is the opposite rudder is just to feel the rudders. The rudder in the direction of the spin is going to be very light. The rudder that's opposing the direction of the spin is going to feel very heavy. It's very similar to a uh, uh, engine out procedure in a multi-engine airplane. So we want to push an opposite rudder and then elevator, move it to neutral. So again, notice the steps, P-A-R-E. The acronym is called PAIR, power, off, aileron, neutral, 
rudder full opposite to the direction of the spin, elevator neutral. Notice that we're moving the elevator after the rudder. We're moving the rudder first, then the elevator second. Uh, when NASA did their testing on this procedure years ago, they recognized that the airplane recovers a bit more efficiently if you move the rudder first, then the elevator next. Also notice that we're not trying to move these inputs or make these inputs simultaneously. That same NASA test discovered that simultaneous applications in this case of the rudder and the elevator uh, doesn't often lead to any uh, increased efficiency in, in spin recovery. And in fact, if all you as the pilot are used to doing is one step followed by the next step, and I say, okay, Mr. or Mrs. Pilot, do both steps simultaneously, what you'll probably end up doing is nothing while your brain is trying to figure out what simultaneous applications of the control surfaces actually mean. But we're not out of the woods yet. Now that the spin is over, the airplane is not auto-rotating anymore. The spin is over. We've stopped. Now we've got more steps. We've got to go back to the rudder. We've got to now neutralize the rudder. Let's say that we still hold full right rudder and we pull back too hard. Well, now the airplane is just going to cross over into a spin to the right side. So once the motion of the nose stops, the spin is over, we're back to the rudder again. Neutralize the rudder. Then pull gently to straighten level flight. Remember earlier we said that what oftentimes will cause the stall is how aggressively you pull. So again, the steps for spin recovery. Pair, power, idle, ailerons, neutral, rudder, full opposite to the direction of the spin, elevator, neutral. And when the spin is over, rudder is neutral, and a gentle pull back to straight and level flight. Well, there's the theory. Let's go fly. Thank you.